Hi everyone, how are you doing today? Running a little late here, trying to get a few things together. And seeing if I can see the chat and the windows at the same time. Okay, so yeah, um, today is going to be a really cool live stream. Um, I don't usually live stream at f on Friday morning, but um, turns out I have a four-day weekend, so I thought this would be a great time to have a live stream, hopefully at a time that's more convenient for everybody. And um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of questions that you guys submitted. And if you have any other questions that come up along the way, just drop them in the chat and I will answer them either as I go or as I see them or um, just at the end. So I'm on my first cup of coffee here, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but before we get started, and as we're kind of letting people trickle in, I thought that I would read this poem that I found a week or two ago by Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, it's just, it's one I actually haven't noticed or read by him before. And it's called The Valley of Unrest. And I was just really blown away by this poem. So let me just... Let me just warm up here by reading this. But first, um, big hello to the pros and cons, Hemerald Cranford and Sumit Rock Sheet. I don't know if I said your names right, but I'm really glad that you're here and it's great to see you all. Also, Darren from Ireland. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm just going to read this and see if my windows will co cooperate here. Okay. The Valley of Unrest by Edgar Allan Poe. Once it smiled a silent dell where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto wars, trusting to the mild-eyed stars, nightly from their azure towers to keep watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sunlight did lazily lay. Now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness. Nothing there is motionless, nothing save the air that broods over the magic solitude. Ah, by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty Hebrides. Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that rustle through the unquiet heaven, uneasily from morn till even, over the violets there that lie in myriad types of the human eye over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave. They wave from out their fragrant tops, external dews come down in drops. They weep from off their delicate stems, perennial tears descend in gems. I really loved this poem because even though it is kind of dark, like you would expect from Edgar Allan Poe, uh, there's this little glimmering of hope, and I think this poem really shows that there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and also just a nice a nice piece that you can find in your memories, even if they're not all positive memories. Um, I actually did a blog post on this, so check that out if you like, um, at my website, classicsconsidered.com, and... Yeah, just sort of sort of deconstructed that a bit more. Hello to Naveen and Blage. Great to see you on the live stream. Looks like I did a better job of notifying people. Usually I'm really bad at that, and usually it's not at a good time. So really excited. Um, so let me go over to the questions that I got from people and... We'll just get started here. Again, if you have any questions you'd like to submit as we go, feel free. And I will answer them as I see them or at the end of the live stream. Let me grab the first question here, which is... And actually, I'm not really doing these in any particular order. I thought I would just... Uh, I don't know. These are totally random. So the first one 
is, do you have a favorite first line from a book? Or what are some favorites if you can't narrow it down to just one? And are there any memorably bad first lines that come to mind? Okay, so let's see here. I do have a favorite first line from a book, and ironically, it's a book I have never read. And so there's a little bit of a story to that. Um, there used to be a video on YouTube that I would watch occasionally, and it was a... Well, I'm not going to go into depth on what the video was about, but it was basically a montage of different things. And one of the pieces of the video was this guy reading the opening line from Resurrection by Leo Tolstoy. And I absolutely fell in love with that line. Maybe it was just the way he was reading it, um, the context of the video, which had this kind of dystopian feel to it. Um, alas, the video is no longer on YouTube, otherwise I'd recommend it to you guys. But anyway, here's the line. Though hundreds of thousands had done their very best to disfigure the small piece of land, on which they were crowded together, by paving the ground with stones, scraping away every vestige of vegetation, cutting down the trees, turning away birds and beasts, and filling the air with the smoke of naphtha and coal. Still spring was spring, even in the town. I think this is the most beautiful line I've ever read, or listened to, I suppose, and I like how he builds up this entire scene for you in this enormous clause. And then at the end, he's like, it's spring and we're in town. So not only is he painting the, the, um, the geographical, physiological <laughs> picture of this place, but he is showing you what it's like from a psychological perspective as well. I mean, there's just so much going on in this one line, and then he ends very simply with this phrase, spring was spring even in the town, and I just love that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I have an interesting relationship with the season of spring. It's been, it used to be my least favorite season, and I think that over time, I came to enjoy it a lot more. And I think that this quote kind of, I don't know, it just resonates with that tension I felt during the spring and still do sometimes. Um, this conflict between, I guess, the harsher realities of the world and the beauty of spring. So, okay, that's, that's a lot about the first line, but I just love that. And that is the reason I want to read this book. I mean, to be honest, I've never read anything by Tolstoy, so it's high time I do. Um, but this book in particular, I know I will read because I just absolutely love that line. Um, so let's see, another question. Let's see what would be a good segue from that. <clears throat> Excuse me. How about this one? How do you choose the books you're going to read? Do you choose them randomly? Do you choose a genre? Do you have a plan, etc.? So, yes, but actually no. Um I <laughs> I have so I'm basically a mood reader and I tend to read books very much by mood. So, um, I have a long list of books I want to read. I keep a running list, but at the same time, I don't um, necessarily have an order that I read them in. Um, I do choose some of the books from that list in order to, well, to come up with like a, an idea of books I could read for each year. So I have a list for 2020, 2021, I'll probably have one for next year, but honestly, I don't stick to that very well at all. So yeah, I just pick whatever sounds good at the time. But that said, I do have phases and themes that I read from, sometimes over years. And some of these phases start really randomly, like my interest in T.E. Lawrence and Middle Eastern history, and others are more intentional. 
Um, last year, I had a goal of reading about Asia, and so I specifically chose books that fit that theme, either Asian literature, history, um, events, that kind of thing. So right now, my phases include uh, Japanese literature, because that's a huge gap in my reading. Uh, Virginia Woolf, who is a British author, I just didn't get around to for years. And then um, Books from Around the World, which is a read-along I'm doing with Blage. And also Automation slash International Relations slash UBI. Um, uh, the latest book I'm reading in that last phase if that wasn't too specific. It's called The Trans-Pacific Experiment, How China and California Collaborate and Compete for Our Future. I just started this. I read the introduction, but I'm really liking it so far. It's got a lot of accolades on the back. Um, cuts right to the heart of the relationship between Silicon Valley and China, the tangled history, the current tensions, and the uncertain future, a must read. And that's from Kai-Fu Lee, who wrote another book called AI Superpowers, which is a fantastic book. I would highly recommend it if you're interested in learning about, um, I mean, on the surface, it's, it's about artificial intelligence, but it's actually about, um, it's actually about Chinese culture contrasted with American culture the different ways they approach technology and problem solving, the different ways their companies run, and then the projections for competition going to the future. Um, I, I'm kind of interested in it both from a techie perspective, since I am a software developer, but also just from a current events perspective. So that's a phase that I'm going to be reading for quite some time. Um, let's see here. Naveen asks, can you do a full video of reading your favorite poems? Yeah, I would love to do that. Actually, I had a similar idea pretty recently, like basically that. So I'm really happy to hear there's interest for that. And I will keep that in mind. Um, Sumit asks, Sylvia Plath or Emily Dickinson? Unfortunately, I haven't read Sylvia Plath yet. Embarrassingly, I might say. Um, she is on my list, but I've heard the subject matter is pretty, pretty dark. And I want to be in a good mental state before I read that, um, all quite seriously. Uh, so yeah, she's definitely on my list to read. I actually read one of her, or Skim read one of her poems recently that was, like, came up as her famous poem on a Google search, but I just sort of glancing through it, I knew I wasn't really going to click with it right now, so I thought I'd wait. All right, so that was books I'm going to read. Let's see. Um, semi-related to this is a question that goes, are there any classics you have intentionally held off reading? Not books that you just haven't got around to yet, or titles you have no desire to read, but books you intend to read, but you're intentionally waiting for a specific time, or whatever reasons you might have. A title you're saving for the future. Okay, so, um, yes, I, I, there is a fine line between <laughs> books I'm putting off and books I haven't, like, I've intended to put off. Um, there's two books that I really want to read in the future, maybe not yet. So, The Little Prince, which is a French classic, and then anything by Borges, because I would really love to read both of these in the original language, and my Spanish isn't quite up to Borges yet, and my French is nowhere near ready for The Little Prince. 
However, those are goals that I have and I'm hoping to do that at some point. Um, yeah, maybe in a few years. <laughs> Is there a specific book that got you into reading? Well, I started reading at a very young age. I want to say like five or six. And so <laughs> I've always been a reader. So the books that got me into reading were basically children's books. And I would say that um, The Boxcar Children was the first series that I really uh, got attached to. Uh, they were still printing... So the original Boxcar Children series was written by Gertrude Chandler Warner, I think is her name. And it comprised, I think, of like, I don't know, 15 books, something like that. A smallish number of books, like 20 or less. And then uh, people started ghostwriting stories for the series. And then it like ballooned into this, I don't know, 100 volume children's series because money, right? But actually, um, some of the later books were actually really good. And I would go to the library and get like four of them and read them in a week because I just enjoyed them so much. And yeah, honestly, you can tell that the writing caliber of the earlier stories is better, but the other stories are just pure fun. And they're like little mysteries, I think. Little mystery adventure stories. Uh, so yeah, um, that was probably the first, the first book that got me into reading. And there were others, but I just think of that as the one. Let's see, um, and then sort of a related question. When was it that you started writing your own stories? I started writing my own stories when I was about seven. And since I hadn't been reading very long, um, it was very much parroting books I'd read at that point or had been read to me. So there was a lot of um, Narnia, Alice in Wonderland knockoffs stuff going on. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I wrote a story about a fantasy world where there was this skeleton in a cave terrorizing everybody but not exactly, like he just hung out in his cave, so that was kind of weird. I think. I don't remember, honestly. I have it somewhere in my folders, but uh, I wrote it with a gel pen on that old computer paper that's got the holes down the sides. <laughs> and then I staple or taped it together to make like a book. So that was fun. And of course, I was the main character, and then also my sister was a side character. And then there was another character that was my imaginary friend named Shelly. So it was kind of random, but I was really proud of that. And then I just started continuing to write on and off throughout life. Um, since then, I've actually written some short stories, like halfway decent short stories, um, a lot of poems and a couple of drafts of novels and then one sort of young adult children's book. Um, it's something that I don't stick to a lot. I wish I really did, but I, I don't know. I think that I'm also a mood writer, so it's a good thing I didn't try to become an author full-time. But I, I like writing a lot. Let's see, um... <clears throat> Here was an interesting question. Do you ever decide to doodle or randomly draw something on paper? Has any book you've read made you want to respond to it with your pen and no words? Honestly, I think I've pretty much written about every book I wanted to write about or had any reaction to. Um, I do draw, a, well, I do. I used to draw a lot, like all the time. And I would listen to music or 
radio dramas or whatever as I was drawing. Um, I have like a bunch of doodles in this sketchbook. Um, not all of them are that great or interesting. I might show a couple of them though. But again, I don't think there was every book that made me just want to draw because I guess I just like writing too much. So, and some of these are just literally unfinished doodles and sketches. So for example, here's a portrait of Basil Rathbone and Sherlock Holmes that I started and didn't finish. Always started with the eyes, so I do have a lot of unfinished sketches of eyes. Um, let's see here, here's another one that... Here's one of, I don't know, these are my paper mountains. I don't know if it's really going to show up. I use that one for the logo of my podcast that I used to do. Um, I know I had one that I was going to show you guys. Oops. And I think what happened is I just didn't... Oh, here it is. So this one's a little morbid. This is Eurydice from Orpheus and the Underworld. Um... I'm not super well up on the story, but I know it from the opera. And it's about Orpheus, the musician who goes down to the underworld to rescue his wife, Eurydice. And um, the caveat is he cannot look at her. Otherwise, the whole thing is not going to work out. Like, he won't be able to rescue her. I mean, literally, my Greek mythologies are very vague, so... <laughs> I'm sure someone can correct me on that one, but that's the gist of the story. And, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, there was one more I was going to show you. It's really stupid, though. It's a picture from The First Men in the Moon by H.G. Wells, and I was trying to draw the scene where they see the, the moon calves, like the moon cows. But I can't draw a cow. So I just drew this scary looking creature with a cow face. And this is the little alien down here. And the two main characters over here. So yeah, it's literally a doodle. Do any of you like to draw? I'm always surprised when I meet people that draw really well and they act like it's nothing. I mean, I'm really curious if any of you guys enjoy drawing or any kind of art, actually. Um, and it was something where originally I just felt like I couldn't draw at all, but after I started using photo references, I improved a lot. Here's a question that I've gotten from a few people on comments, on videos. Why do you film a long, detailed review about a book you did not enjoy? I mean, fair question, I suppose. So there's two reasons for this. Um, first one is when I do that, it allows me to organize my thoughts on a book and explore what I like and dislike about something and just generally provide support for my reaction. Um, I don't like just reacting to a book and not figuring out why. I'm all about why. So this gives me a way to really explore the pros and cons, or in this case, mostly the cons of a book. <clears throat> and then the other reason is that I consider myself a book critic as well as a book reviewer. So. Um, I think it's worth giving each book a chance and just giving it critique if I find something to critique about it. Well, 
looking for the next question here. Okay, here's a big question. Oops. What makes a classic, and have you read any modern literary novel that you think could or should be a classic? I've talked about this a couple of times, and I think that my opinions on this continue to evolve, which is just a lazy way of saying I really am not sure. <laughs> so colloquially, I, I use the word classic to mean an old book, but that's not accurate. I mean, you can have an old book that's not classic. Um, I think a classic really depends on the subculture, or the culture or the subculture that values the book. Um, and I think as our world becomes more globalized, we're going to see a lot more subcultures crop up to kind of fill in that natural desire for them. So with that, I think classics are going to move away from being based around countries or even languages and then like become more centered around those subcultures, those niche interests. Um, and, and that's good and bad, right? Like there's pros and cons to that. Um, so now generically, when we talk about classics, we tend to think of the Western canon, but because I am viewing it by culture, I think any book that left an impact in anywhere in the world should be considered a classic. And the impact could be any number of things. Maybe it inspired other books. Maybe it influenced the culture of that area. Maybe uh, it actually influenced events. Um, it is a subjective thing, though, because there are books that used to be considered classics which are not read hardly ever anymore. I think a good example of this would be Ben-Hur, which had a really strong stint as a classic, especially in the United States. And then in recent times, if you talk about American classics, hardly anybody mentions it. Incidentally, I did read it once, but I did find the language to be difficult to get into. I tried rereading it recently and the descriptions continued to bog me down, and I don't mind descriptions, but it just, I can see why it just doesn't click with people as much anymore, especially with the excellent film adaptation with Charlton Heston. Um, but yeah, I think that's an example how classics come and go. Um, there are some, of course, that have just really been fortunate enough to retain their classic status, but... Uh, it's it's definitely subjective. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say is that oftentimes classics have universal themes, whether that's family, war, love, um, just different things, brotherhood. Not always the case, though, so I would hesitate to say that's a must-have. But typically classics appeal to people from many different cultures and backgrounds. So I think that would be my elevator, my long elevator description of what makes a classic. Um, I haven't read a lot of modern literary novels, so I'm not the best person to suggest one. Um, I think that A Pale View of Hills by Kazuo Ishiguro was excellent. I don't know if it will ever be considered a classic simply because not only is it one of his lesser known novels at this point, but um, it does appeal to a very specific culture. And uh, that's okay. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a classic. It's probably my favorite modern literary novel, but yeah. Um, and then sort of related to that, there was someone who asked which living authors and or books do you think will have the greatest lasting power? And again, I don't think I'm a good person to answer this question because I haven't read enough yet to say. And 
again, I love Ishiguro. He's like the one living author I've read the most of. Um, I don't think he's going to have, if I'm being honest, I don't think he's going to have the kinding, blasting power of, I don't know, say Charles Dickens or whatever. It's too soon to say, but I think he just appeals so strongly, so strongly to a certain niche or subset of people. Um, but that subset of people is still pretty small right now. Um, we're not talking large enough subsections of society, but we'll see. This can all change very quickly. So, <laughs> Looks like most of us used to draw and not as much anymore. And pros and cons says, I like to paint from time to time. That is so cool. I used to do watercolor painting, but I haven't um, done that in so long. Always wanted to get into oil painting, but it scared me, honestly. <laughs> okay, um, the pros and cons also asks, is there a genre that you wish you read more from? I think science fiction right now. Uh, science fiction, because I love the genre. I love the film. Uh, films that are science fiction, many classics that are science fiction. Um, but honestly, I haven't read most of the science fiction classics of the 20th century. We're talking Dune, um, anything by Asimov. Um, what's that one called? Do Androids Dream? of Electric Sheep, also known as Blade Runner, which honestly, this is a way better title in my opinion, but anyway. Yeah, so those are some that I would love to read. was thinking about reading Dune this year, but it is pretty long, so I, I don't know. I should probably get started if I'm going to do that. Yeah, science fiction for sure. And then there's like contemporary science fiction that I'd like to read as well. Such as the, um, I can't remember the author's name, but there's a Chinese science fiction author and it's called the, th and his book is called The Three Something and it's got like a picture of a pyramid on the cover. It's, I think it's considered hard science fiction though, so that could be a challenge, but yeah. What about you guys? What um, genres do you want to read more of, whether that's classics or just books in general? It's funny because even though I love science fiction, I just haven't made it as much of a priority recently, which is too bad. Somebody asked, I really like your booktube concept. May I know what inspires you to have this particular concept of your videos? Um, yeah, so this tabletop, this tabletop style I got from a couple of ASMR YouTubers, believe it or not. Uh, shout out to the French Whisperer and ASMR Vids. I've been following them for years. So when I started my booktube channel, well, I knew I didn't want to show my face because I just, you know, I like to maintain a level of privacy there. Uh, but I just was definitely inspired by their tabletop setup setups and uh it just it's actually it's actually very easy for me to do this so that's another plus of this style um, as far as the reviews i've been reviewing books for over 10 years so i think i've gotten into a kind of groove as far as what i want to talk about how long to make the review and how to avoid spoilers creatively, because I don't like to talk about spoilers a lot, um, with some exceptions. Yes, it was called The Three-Body Problem, that's it. Yeah. It's highly rated, so I think that'll be an interesting... I think it's a trilogy, maybe. There's multiple books. Um, but yeah, so... 
ASMR videos have definitely inspired me, which I guess is no surprise as people think my channel is ASMR as well. Although that was not the intention originally. Um, but I was honored to be part of the French Whisperers um, compilation video he released earlier this year. It was a video showing different educational ASMR channels. Um, so that was really, really a dream come true to collaborate with him. And uh, I'm really excited that I'm able to reach more people that way as well. And also give back to the ASMR community because it's really been helpful for me, um, both from the educational aspect, but also just a way to, you know, relax and and not be watching, I don't know, the news or politics or whatever. Um, let's see. How are you able to prioritize reading in the busyness of life? Well, I don't have a super busy life, if I'm being honest. It's just, it's just me, myself, and I around here. Um, Career-wise, I really try to choose jobs that give me a good work-life balance instead of the highest paycheck. I don't watch a lot of movies or shows by myself. Um, I'll, I'll watch one with my family once a week or so, but I don't really do that <laughs> otherwise. And I've given up a lot of other hobbies. I mean, I used to do music like regular regularly. I used to sew quite a bit. I did some light gaming and like, all, like, I don't know. I, I had so many hobbies, so I had to give up some of that and just focus on reading. And then I also have a habit of reading before bedtime. It's something I started when I was a small child and I just never grew out of it. So that helps me get some reading in in the day, even if it's just a few pages and helps me uh, de-stress as well. The Pros and Cons asks, is there a book you didn't expect to like, but you did? Um, yes, actually. I mean, hmm. There's been quite a few like that, I think. Um, trying to think of a good example, though, right now. <laughs> okay, um... I think one book that really did that for me was Brave New World by, uh, the name escapes me, Huxley, that's right. Um, so I didn't have a great experience with 1984, and when I got to Brave New World, I actually wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't necessarily expect to dislike it, but I wasn't expecting to like it either. I was kind of on the, on the fence about it. Really, actually kind of liked it um it's it's super super weird maybe that's why i like it and also very british in terms of the uh, the dialogue and the setting it reminded me almost of a pg woodhouse novel but like dark <laughs> so yeah i actually enjoyed Brave New World much more than I expected to, even though it's super, super strange. Joseph says, I totally ripped off your video setup for my most recent videos. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, I think we all get inspired by each other and uh, it's just a very easy setup. So I think I'd love to see more of this on YouTube. Okay, somebody asked, what would be good books to get into Russian literature? Any particular translations? I can't read Russian. Well, neither can I, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to give you good translations from a Russian perspective. Well, obviously I can't, but... Um, so I would recommend, kind of depending where you're coming from, but Fathers and Sons is a solid place to start because it's, it comes kind of in the middle 
of Russian literature. It's not super early. It's not super recent. And you can see a cross-section of different, uh, different themes that come back over and over again in Russian literature. Obviously, the family aspect, which is huge in Dostoevsky. Um, but also the conflict between the old ways and the new ways. Um, yeah, as it says here, the clash between the older Russian aristocracy and the youthful radicalism that foreshadowed the revolution to come. Um, but beyond that, I just thought this was a very... Uh, this is a novel that keeps your interest and has a lot of drama in it, but not like crazy drama. Like, it's just a nice... I don't know. It's a solid novel. So, this is the George Reavy translation. I think I read Constance Garnett on... Um, Project Gutenberg. Mixed opinions on Constance Garnett. I think she was the first or one of the first English translators of Russian literature, but her <clears throat> her translations tend to be very dated. However, I thought it was fine. Um, I don't know. I'd probably seek out something by Penguin or maybe even the Signet Classics, but I haven't read it yet, so can't really say for sure. But I do think it's one of those books that you'll enjoy, even if the translation isn't perfect. <clears throat> um, another book that I would recommend is uh, Eugene Onegin by Alexander Pushkin. I have one of my translations here. This is the Penguin Classics translated by Stanley Mitchell. I did a read-along of this back in, I want to say, 2015 on my blog. A lot of the people there hadn't read it before, and they actually liked it. It is written in verse, so if you're not into poetry, um, you might want to seek out a prose translation. I think there's one by Roger Clark, but the poetry is part of the story because this takes place in the romantic era, I would say. And it's about a poet and also a Byronic anti-hero, a young country girl who falls in love with the Byronic hero. And it, there's actually a lot of drama in this book and some surrealism. And the ending is really good. So I really recommend this. I know um, novels in verse are not everybody's cup of tea, but just give it a try. If you're looking to get into Dostoevsky, I don't think there's a bad place to start. If you're looking for something shorter, uh, Notes from the Underground is really short. Um, it's... Uh, I think it really is indicative of some of the longer monologues that you'll find in his novels, in his long novels. But it might be a bit depressing for some people, so just a heads up. I mean, most of his novels have a very serious, somber tone, so this is probably just like another step above that. Um, and then um, the short stories of Anton Chekhov would be another good place to start. I don't have a copy here, but I read some of them a few years ago and they were just nice, bite-sized, uh, beautifully written short stories. So, yeah, you can't go wrong with Chekhov either. Thanks for um, hanging out, Darren. It was good seeing you. And, uh, yeah, we actually still have more questions, believe it or not. So let me see if I can... Wait, there's one from the pros and cons, she asks. Do you... Exp Wait. Oh, favorite film adaptation of a novel. I have so many. That's the problem. Is I just... Um, I have so many. 
<clears throat> so it'd be difficult to choose one. Um, I think that You Can't Go Wrong with North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, it's not... Like, I didn't even love the novel that much. And the movie is maybe not my top favorite. Well, it's definitely not my top favorite. But as a movie, it is so good. And it's... I think it's fairly faithful as well. Um, I love the Horatio Hornblower series. Which is a Royal Navy series. Um, this is from like the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's a TV series, but they did a really good job with the budget that they have. And the script is so good. Um, of course, The Lord of the Rings might be my favorite adaptation. I just think it's perfect on so many levels. Um, not perfect across the board, but for an adaptation, it's pretty good. If you've watched any Sherlock Holmes adaptations and then you compare it with the Lord of the Rings adaptation, you realize what an amazing attention to detail, faithfulness to the spirit of the story, and an incredible cast that they had. And then I will mention, since we're talking about Sherlock Holmes, the Granada TV adaptation of Sherlock Holmes, starring Jeremy Brett, which is fantastic. Um, not even across the board. So yeah, some of the later episodes were not so great, but especially the earlier ones, they did such a good job. And he's really good. Those are my, those are some of my favorites. Um, Prabhakar says hello. Good to see you. Glad you could join. Um, Joseph asks, do you expect any pandemic-related literature to get published in the next few years? Um, I think there already are some. I don't know if there's going to be any that are, like, you know, <laughs> epic-level literature. But um, I, I have seen a few titles floating about already. Um, I was going to write a book about the pandemic, but it might be too soon. I almost feel like I need to wait a little longer. Um, mostly because, well, so I've been writing down like just plain facts and things that happened throughout the pandemic. And then I have this idea of what I want the book to be like, to like be more than just about the pandemic, but more of a, a uh, symbolic book. But I just don't know if I'm ready to write it. There's a danger in waiting too long because then you lose enthusiasm. And then there's the danger of doing it too soon and you're just too close to the subject matter. I think if you were to write it maybe 10 years from now, it might be really good. But then I don't know if I want to wait that long, so we'll see. Aw. Sir in the chat says, what would you say is your all-time favorite classic? Your silver inspiring sending you love from India. Also, what are your go-to editions, publishers for classics? I really appreciate that. Um, that. That means a lot, man. Um, so yeah, my favorite classic, and somebody else asked this question as well on the blog, so... Okay, so I do pretty much like a current um, current favorites because um, the problem with saying something is my all-time favorite is that if I haven't read it in a long time, my opinion may have changed. 
Um, of course, I love the Sherlock Holmes series. That just left a huge impact on me growing up. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's really hard for me to say with some of those books I read like over 10, 15 years ago. I'm really hesitant to say any of those are still favorites because it's just a little fuzzy in my memory. Currently, my current favorites are The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, which is something I've read many times and will continue to read periodically just because I keep finding new stuff in it and it just resonates with me on so many levels. Um, the Painted Veil by W. Somerset Maugham, which I read pretty recently, I think last year, early last year. Um, I just love this book. Uh, it's not perfect. It's got a lot of dated stuff in it. But just at, for the story and the writing style, it's just beautiful. And the characters also left a big impression on me. And then, of course, Eugene Onegin, which I talk about quite a bit. Um, this is one of my favorite classics. Maybe my most favorite classic. But again, it changes from day to day. Blosh says they still skipped Tom Bombadil. <laughs> yeah, they did. Actually, to be fair, that whole beginning part of the Fellowship of the Ring in the movies, like, they just, they kind of skimmed over that part in order to show probably more of the backstory and stuff, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they should have done, like, a two-part version of the Fellowship of the Ring for a total of four films. <laughs> I know it's not a neat trilogy, but that would have been cool. Um, my go-to editions, publishers for classics. Um, I don't have one here to show, but Oxford World Classics is probably my go-to because they're really good for the most part when it comes to the translations of books from other languages. And they usually have pretty tasteful covers and good information about the author inside. And then Second to Oxford World Classics, I do like these Penguin Classics because they're always very readable. The font's a good size, easy to get, they look pretty nice. Um, but yeah, Oxford would be my first choice. Ranger Sly says, howdy. Uh, Sarah says, please do an updated bookshelf tour or something related to your bookshelves. I could do that. Um, unfortunately, I haven't acquired a lot of, well, let me, let me put it differently. I have acquired a lot of books. The, the, I have a, a shelf for the books I've read and a book, a shelf for the books I have not read. It might be good to do an updated video. I just think there would be a lot of overlap with the old videos, but yeah, maybe I'll do that. The pros and cons asks, most disappointing film adaptation. I think that one of the most disappointing film adaptations was Nicholas Nickleby. 2002-ish? I didn't care for that one because it was too lighthearted. Like, the story is one of Dickens' very darkest stories about a young man who goes up against child abusers and like molesters of women like it's a very dark story and they tried to turn it into like this comedy i guess or not comedy but just way too lighthearted. you just can't do that i mean if the book is about tough subject matter then you pretty much have to stick with the darker tone which is too bad because it had a pretty good cast there were a lot of famous actors in that one Um, what were some other ones? Oh, there are more. I think I tried to erase them from my memory, but that one particularly stuck out as being egregious. Oh, hi, Ingram. Nice to see you in the chat. Uh, tell me, as a Native American, what are some books I can recommend my advanced students 
to improve their English lingo. Hmm. So, so good books for vocabulary. Hmm. Um, I honestly think that, yeah, let me, let me think about that for a bit. I might have to come back to that question. Um, you know, poetry can be a really good way to improve your vocabulary because you'll find a lot more uh, different kinds of words in poetry, especially rhyming poetry where the authors are trying to, you know, make things fit together better. Um, so yeah, I would probably look at poetry for vocabulary. And the nice thing about poetry is that you're not reading super long sentences, but just little short pieces. So it helps you focus on those words a bit more. Um, have you read any of my favorite Victorian era author, George Eliot? Sadly, um, wait, I did read Sil Silas Marner. Yes, very long time ago, and I liked it. Um, I haven't read anything since then. I have it on my plans to read Middle March when I can get some dedicated time to focusing on such a longer book. So I'm really hoping to do that. I've watched a number of her television adaptations and really enjoyed them. In fact, that's one of the reasons I want to read more from her. But yeah, Middle March is definitely on the horizon. I just don't know <laughs> how soon I'll be able to get to it. Uh, thoughts on audiobooks. Do you think they're good? They're as good as physical books or ebooks? Yes, I think they're as good. It's a different experience, but I think it's just as good. And the reason for that is because the original way people told stories was, you know, verbally. And uh, I think we need to continue that. Now, obviously, an audiobook is not quite the same thing as storytelling because. You're just reading something that was written. It's not, you know, improvised, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, but I think depending on the book, you can get similar a similar experience to as if someone, someone was telling you a story. It's not going to be good for really technical bo books or anything super, uh, super taxing on your brain. But for fiction, I think it's quite good. I listened to some audiobooks a few years ago when I was having some back pain and I just couldn't, I didn't feel comfortable reading books like I usually did. And that was very helpful. Um, my only problem with audiobooks is my mind does tend to wander, so sometimes I have to stop or rewind. Um, and I don't get that quite as much when I'm reading a physical book. Um, I want to shout out LibriVox.org, which is where you can find public domain audiobooks by read by volunteers and the quality is as you would expect a little hit and miss but david barnes and peter yearsley are a couple of readers i would recommend and they also have um audiobooks where people read different parts if you're into that so yeah i would i would check that out it's all free so it's just worth a try Acklis, I think I don't know if I said that right, asks, do you think reading consistently has had any positive impact on attention span? Or have you noticed any in your personal life? Um, yes and no. So since I started reading pretty young, it definitely helped my attention span. Um, to be reading books. We didn't have high-speed internet back then, let alone YouTube, and we didn't have cable television, so I would watch movies fairly regularly, but also reading was kind of my main source of entertainment, apart from videos. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I think it helped a lot. Although I think music actually helped more, like practicing music. Um, I, since the internet became more of a part of my life, I've really had trouble with attention span. And I still do today. Like, I can't read for the lengths of times I used to read when I was like eight years old. Like, I just can't. <laughs> Maybe if I were to completely give up the internet and just go back to a non-digital lifestyle. But that's kind of impossible due to the job that I have. So, yeah, it did. Um, but it's been kind of a chore to, or a chore. It's been kind of a challenge to maintain the positive effects. And that's one reason I want to continue reading is to keep up that habit. Um, let's see here. Oh, I guess this is kind of a related question someone had. Did you start reading classics as a teen? And if so, did you understand them? <clears throat> Coffee break. Okay. Um, I started reading classics... Well, my mother started reading me classics when I was pretty young, like when I was seven or eight. We found a bunch of books on sale at the bookstore when there used to be a bookstore at the mall. And my mother had watched some of the adaptations already on Masterpiece Classic, or Masterpiece Theater as it was then called, which was something they played on public television. Um, so that's kind of how we got into the classics and... I started reading them on my own when I was about 10 or 11. I can guarantee you I didn't understand everything, but I got the gist of the stories and I really loved them. So I had a phase where I read Charles Dickens, um, whatever I could get my hands on as far as the Brontes, and you know, just sort of went from author to author that way. So what I will say is it's easy to get overwhelmed and intimidated by classics, but the best thing you can do is just read them immersively. Like, don't worry about the parts you don't understand. Uh, you'll get better as you read more of them, and your vocabulary vocabulary will generally expand. Um, so I didn't I didn't stop and look up every word in the dictionary. I just sort of read and understood by context. Um, so that's the way I would recommend reading classics. Otherwise, you will certainly get bogged down. And at the end of the day, the most important thing is whether you get the story. And then those more subtle layers of analysis, like that can come later. Um, but as a teenager or a child, just focusing on the story is the way to go. And then after you've read the book, watch a film adaptation and that'll further help you understand what's going on. A faithful film adaptation, I should say. Um, let's see. So, favorite classic authors, favorite and least favorite books. I think I'll come back to those. Ingram says, they, my students, just like modern stuff. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the problem with modern literature is that not all of it is good for expanding your vocabulary. Um, what books or authors have had a permanent constant effect on your understanding, personality, etc.? This was a really, really interesting question to me because... I had to go way back because anything too recent is going to be, well, I, I won't know if it's permanent. <laughs> um, so I've already mentioned Arthur Conan Doyle and the Bronte sisters, specifically Charlotte Bronte. Um, with Arthur Conan Doyle, I think not just Sherlock Holmes, but his other books. So there's the Professor Challenger series, which is a science fiction uh trilogy or like four books that he wrote 
He also wrote um, a couple of books that take place in medieval England. And so I read those. I read some of his obscure stuff as well and his horror short stories. Um, But I think from him I really learned how to read people. Um, Obviously, Charles Dickens and Agatha Christie played a role in that too, but uh, I, I credit Doyle as giving me that curiosity about people, a desire to understand them, and just helping me develop empathy as a very young person. Um, yeah. I would say Doyle was really big in that way for me. When it comes to Charlotte Bronte, um, specifically... I think the novel Villette was pretty influential. I'm way more like the main character, Lucy Snow, than I would like to be. Um, But through Charlotte Bronte's work in particular, I found a coping mechanism for some of the things I was dealing with in my high school years. And her female characters are highly resilient. So I really appreciated that. I really looked up to her female characters and how they were not afraid to take on both the challenges that face them in the outer world, but also in their inner spiritual world. Um, So that's something I guess I took from her characters and I will always appreciate that about them. Um, And then the last one would be more recently Kierkegaard. And his Christian existentialism has been very helpful for me, helping me mature a bit in my faith. And um, I don't, again, agree with him on everything, but I think his, his ideas and his imagery of this knight of faith, K-N-I-G-H-T, um, really helped me in recent years. And I think that'll stick with me forever. Another fun question. If you could take an element of writing from a few different authors, um, to make one super author, which elements would you choose? And this person gives some examples. The craft of Jane Austen, the humor of Mark Twain, the subject matter of Poe, the intelligence of someone else. Yeah, so I had to think about this one a little bit. There are so many um, great authors that I appreciate for various reasons. Um, So I'm going to say for Arthur Conan Doyle, or from Arthur Conan Doyle, his character painting, which I kind of just talked about. uh, I love the writing of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Just you know, not everything about his books, but the way he crafts his sentences, the poetry of his writing. And yet it's not super elaborate. It's kind of simple in a way. But he's one of those authors that just draws me in from the beginning. And I think that simplicity, that balance between simplicity and beauty is really, really great. Would love to have that in this super author. Um, Even more so, the subtlety of Kazuo Ishiguro, who we've mentioned earlier. Um, The emotion of Dostoevsky. Um, Sometimes I joke about his characters and how (laughs) angsty they are, but honestly, uh, there are few authors who can affect you so deeply as Dostoevsky. So I would choose him for that. Uh, Jules Verne. I love Jules Verne's imagination. The situations he creates for his characters and the worlds that he builds for them. So much fun. Uh, Humor. I love Chesterton's humor. Uh, It's not for everyone, perhaps, but he has a way of just making you laugh out loud at very 
funny and strange things. And he doesn't take himself too seriously, which I think just also is very attractive to a reader because, you know, it's less of an investment for you, but at the same time, you're getting pulled into it a lot more. And then I think the psychology of Joseph Conrad, I like how his characters have like more layers than an onion. I mean, there's just a lot going on in his characters and I really appreciate that. So this would be a very uh, <laughs> interesting author. I'm not sure if all of these characteristics are compatible, <laughs> if we're being honest, but I think it would be a fun book to read. <clears throat> What about you guys? What um what are your favorite characteristics from different authors? Like what would be your your super author? Ingram asks, uh, have you read 1984 and what are my impressions? So yes, actually that ties into another question I will answer. So I already told you about my favorite books. Um, <laughs> so the same person asked me, what are my least favorite books? I'm going to get a lot of flack for this one. These are my hot takes. Um, the three that came to mind when I was filling this out, and I'm sure there's more, but uh, 1984, The Odyssey, and The Divine Comedy. Honestly, um, I feel like these books are pretty overrated. I really hated the main character of 1984. I liked the idea of it. Some of the themes, yes. But if I don't like the character, it's really hard for me to even care about the story. Um, the Odyssey, I just thought it was pretty boring, honestly. And the Divine Comedy, I think, is just, there was so much self-insertion on the part of the author that I just did not care for it. So, yeah. I, that's not to throw any aspersions on these books for those of you that love these books. This is simply my personal opinion. I will be doing a video soonish on the Divine Comedy. There were things I liked about it. I wouldn't write it off as like, oh, you shouldn't read this or anything. In fact, I wouldn't say that about any of these. Um, do read them. Do make your own opinions. I just, yeah, they didn't work for me. Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. Aklis asks, I just started reading Nostromo. Cool. I'm really excited about that. You know, the, the beginning is really a little hard to get into, but it gets better. Uh, what's your favorite Conrad book? I think my favorite is probably... Mm, that's really hard. I think The Shadow Line is really good. It's short. It kind of covers similar ground as Lord Jim. Um, but that one's, that's one's really stuck with me. <clears throat> it has some... Nice surrealism in it as well. I think Heart of Darkness is really good, but I haven't I need to read that one again. Give an updated an updated review. Um Under Western Eyes I absolutely was blown away by when I read it, but I didn't understand all of the historical references. So I'm hesitant to say that's my favorite yet because I also need to read that one again and understand it better. But um, yeah, Shadow Line is so good. Let's see. Hmm, so if we're going to be talking about books we don't like, 
<laughs> Somebody asked me, any classic you think doesn't deserve status, whether in quality or because it's famous for non-literary reasons? Um, yeah. I think just, I'm not gonna, like, I had a few ideas for this. I'm just gonna say, I don't think The Castle by Franz Kafka was that great. I really had to f force myself to finish it. And it is an unfinished novel, to be fair, and he never intended anyone to read it, so there's that. Um, I think that it it's considered a classic... Well, it does... Some people really do like it, so that's great. I mean, I'm glad for them. I love Kafka. I was really sad I didn't like this book. Um, the concept is really cool. It's about this guy who gets... Well, he comes to this town thinking he's going to do some work for the castle and then completely gets sidetracked and never gets to do what he's supposed to be doing there. But it was just too much of a tangent for me. I mean, his his books have lots of tangents in them, but this one was just one big tangent. And it just didn't feel like it had any cohesion for me. And I don't think I will be trying it again. Um, but if we're going to be saying that, um, I'm going to go back and say, back and answer this other question, which is your favorite classic authors. And in spite of the fact that I don't love all of his work, uh, Kafka is certainly one of my favorite authors. Also love Jules Verne in spite of his simple characters. I like his, his world building, his stories. Um, some of his later work is actually a little more psychologically uh, complex. So if you're looking for Verne that's more modern, I guess, maybe try reading... Well, I'm always trying to get people to read Magellania because no one's heard of it, and yet it's probably his best book. I'm also trying to get people to read Paris <laughs> in the 20th century, which is his long lost novel that was written in the 1860s takes place in the 1960s and was discovered in like the 1990s so it's a good it's a good uh, dystopian type of novel and it's interesting to see the direction he was going in his later life so i think it's a pity that his his more famous books overshadow these two um, other favorite authors, I mean, I, I love Ishiguro's earlier work. I don't know if he's considered a classic yet because he's still living and his books were only published in the 80s, so it's not been that long. Um, and then lately I've been enjoying Somerset Mom. Um, I like the consistency of his characters and how his stories kind of develop naturally from the characters. So. But I've only read two of his books so far, so I'm... It's still to be determined. Johan asks, have you read Charles Portis? No, but True Grit is on my list to read. So I, I don't know, I've been, I've been planning to read that for years. I need to really do that. So along with science fiction, I think the Western is the other genre I want to read more of. Because I, I do enjoy watching Westerns, classic Westerns.
Okay, so somebody asks, what are these two things on the table? These are pine cones. These are cinnamon scented pine cones that I got from the store. So I didn't just find them, unfortunately. Um, I don't think we have a lot of these where I live. We have Douglas fir cones, which are narrow and they look a lot more different than these. Um, but yeah, I like pine cones. Um, you can find these, I think, if you go down to Oregon or maybe out further from the suburbs here. Most obscure classics you've read. Okay, I just mentioned a couple by Jules Verne. Um, here's a little list that I came up with earlier. Uh, the Air of Redcliffe by Charlotte Mary Young, which is referenced in Little Women. This was a bestseller of its day, and I read it, I think, in 2010, 12, something like that. Long time ago. <laughs> anyway, um, The Air of Red Cliff, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. It was kind of, it was kind of interesting historically, but not, not the best novel. I can see why it hasn't aged well, let's put it that way. The Green Ray by Jules Verne. So pretty much nobody has heard of this or read it, but it's a ro romantic comedy, believe it or not. I did enjoy that one. Embers by Shonda Mari, a Hungarian author. Uh, Hyperion, the one novel by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Fanshawe and the Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Marble Fawn was really good, by the way. I don't know why more people aren't reading it. Um, it takes place in Rome. So a lot of it is just the scenery of Rome of the 1800s. So if that's not really your thing, then it might not be interesting to you. But I liked it. And then Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. Which, again, everyone's heard of Lewis Carroll. Almost nobody's read Sylvie and Bruno. I really actually enjoyed this book a lot. Um, but it is kind of, it's pretty different than Alice in Wonderland. All right, I think I got to the end of the questions. Oh, I had one more question. <laughs> so, not book related. What kind of music do you like? I like all kinds of music. Um, I, uh, oh, okay, I was showing you the wrong thing. So first let me um, show you that list that I thought I was showing you. And I'll just leave that up for a couple minutes in case you want to note any of these down. Um, I would say of all of these, um, these, these ones were definitely worth a try. This one, yeah, again, interesting, but not something I would necessarily recommend. Even this one might not be for everybody. It, it was not super memorable. Um, Embers was super good. The Green Ray was entertaining. And the Marble Fawn was also pretty memorable. And Sylvie and Bruno is just fun. But again, not going to be for everybody because it's about fairies. So... <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I did read Embers by Shandor Mari. I want to read more by him because I was just blown away by that book. Um, it takes place in this forest, in this castle. This general is waiting for his long, long lost friend, or not long lost friend, long estranged friend to arrive. And they start, he starts thinking about the past that he had with this person and of course, there was a, a woman involved, and it, it's very romantic with a lowercase, no, with a capital R. You know, it's it's just so nostalgic, 
And it's just a very cozy book to read. So I liked that one a lot. Also has some interesting history in it. So um, Nara in the chat asks, well, first, hi, Nara. Nice to see you. Have you read Clarice Lispector or any other Brazilian writer? Not yet. I think I will be um, for our round the world reading challenge. I think I'll be reading either her or somebody similar, but that was definitely one of the names we discussed reading. Is there a particular book by Clarice Lispector you'd recommend? And then Blaj asks, how's Jacob von Gunten treating you? So yeah, we are reading um, Jacob von Gunten, Robert Walser. Walser. Um, yeah, I'm liking it so far. I am still very early in the book because I had some stuff come up this week and I just didn't get to reading this much, but I think I will have... We'll have ample time to catch up today. Um, and I'm liking it a lot. I like the... Uh, there's some lines in this book that just... Really outstanding. I'm going to have to um, maybe do some... Maybe do a video of quotes or something when I'm done. It does kind of remind me a little bit of Kafka, but it's not quite so obscure. I like it a lot so far. Um, yeah, so the last question here was, uh, what sort of music do you like? Um, I like pretty much all kinds of music, literally. Um, I think the two genres I don't care for are metal and modern country. Um, but if I like the melody and the lyrics, then I will pretty much listen to most genres. I especially like indie artists, so indie folk, indie pop, retro pop, uh, those kind of more obscure things. <laughs> I enjoy classical. I used to go to operas at the movie theater when pandemic wasn't happening. I so I know a lot of classical music because I studied it growing up and ended up listening to it most of the time. So for better or worse, I mean, I, I can tell you pretty much like most classical music. I can recognize most classical music, I would say. Um, post-rock, I do enjoy post-rock, which is like instrumental rock music, experimental. Uh, lo-fi, like lo-fi, and some K-pop. And um, yeah, just a little bit of everything. So I have a blog, a personal blog called Gifted with Thought. And I will often post music on there. So if that's something that interests you, feel free to check it out. And sometimes I'll do like an album review where I sort of do like I do book reviews, like go through each song and tell you what I think. Uh, yeah, so that's fun. I do listen to a lot of music, mostly on YouTube. Yeah, but YouTube's been really good for finding new music because I'll just... Like, at this point, I pretty much just look at YouTube recommendations, and they're getting better and better, so. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. So, Nara has a couple of recommendations for Clarice Lispector. I'm going to post them here. And I will copy these over to my list as well, so I will remember those. Thank you. Propacar asks, when are you planning to come back to Instagram? <laughs> no, I don't think I'll go back to Instagram anytime soon. Uh, I did enjoy it at times, but it 
it's not really my forte, that short format. I think I do better at YouTube and blogging and yeah, maybe someday, but I'm pretty happy not having Instagram right now. Blotch says, I'm on my second read through Jacob Von Gunten. Wow. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to have to uh, definitely finish it. Yeah, I mean, I can see why you would be reading it again, because already I've I've kind of lingered on some parts that oh, just make, make me question things. <laughs> That's cool. Hacks for you says, hi, suggest any strategy to approach mathematics. Well, I don't know if you're a subscriber. I don't really talk about math a lot on this channel, but welcome. Um, I, yeah, I, I did, um, let's see, I did up to calculus two. So I'm, I've done math. <laughs> uh, Let's see. I think if you're going to be learning math, just try to find a good resource. So if you're finding that the current book or video you're using is too hard, try to find another one because sometimes there's just like there's multiple ways to explain things and it's best to just keep diff trying different things. Like don't get stuck in one book or one method but try a lot of different methods until you find something that works. I remember when I was in, when I was studying algorithms actually for computer science, which is very mathematical. I really struggled with the lectures and I just ended up going home. I found a YouTube video where some guy, some guy was explaining it in like five minutes and it just clicked. <laughs> so definitely uh, try different, different options. Like don't, Try to, if something's not working for you, try something else. Um, I don't really talk about math on this channel, though. Uh, yeah, and by the way, if I've mispronounced anybody's names in this chat, I do apologize. Um, I'm terrible at pronunciations. I'm terrible at English pronunciations as well. And I think that's because when I started reading, I was reading very phonetically. And that helped me remember what words meant. But at the same time, I just completely butchered the pronunciations of certain words. And then embarrassed myself later on. So, yeah. So, yes. Uh, do correct me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, no, I didn't enjoy Calculus 2, possible pilot deviation. Uh, but I somehow made it through. Um, yeah. Honestly, uh, my computer science degree was very theory heavy, which hasn't been of much use to me in my job, but it was nice to get that background. And if I ever go back, I could probably pick up somewhere close to where I left off. Well, we made it to the end of the questions. If you have any other uh, last minute questions or thoughts, let me know. It's been really fun. So glad to see a lot of more people could make it, um, at this time. And, uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, ideas for videos, anything, just let me know. Um, I don't know when I'll be able to do this time again for a live stream, but I will definitely try to do it again at some point. And, yeah. Hacks for you says, I need a computer science degree, but suck a lot at maths. Honestly, um, different colleges teach it differently. So, you might want to... I don't know, it just depends what's available for you in your area. For example, here in the Seattle area, there's some schools that focus more on the, the actual programming and the application. And then there's some schools like the University of Washington that tend to be more theory focused. Uh, so 
Yeah, I would honestly, if you want to get into programming and you're not so great at math, my two pieces of advice would be one, do a lot of YouTube tutorials where you're actually building projects. And two, start building a portfolio of projects. Um, you can host them on GitHub. You can host them on Heroku and other cloud services. Amazon has like a, a tier where you can just pay by what you use and not like a bunch. But anyway, there's options. Uh, I would really recommend building a portfolio, focusing on those projects. And then, um, better yet, if you can like participate in group projects. So um, there is a website called Catchafire where you can collaborate with uh, nonprofits and they can give you projects to work on. Um, if you know anybody in the industry, ask them if you can get an internship where they work or even just job shadowing. I mean, there's a lot of creative ways you can get into it. It's, it's not like you necessarily have to have a degree. Um, and even if you end up going for the degree later, you'll have that nice foundation to build off of. Um, but yeah, network a lot. Like, network as much as you can. And um, also think about your personal presentation. Practice doing interviews. Uh, practice giving presentations. Explaining the way you work, like your thought process. And it doesn't have to even be to a technical person. You could, you know, you could ask your mom, like, hey, can I explain something to you? Like, and actually, if you can explain something to someone who's not technical, that's a powerful skill that will help you even in the technical world. Because you'll often be working with people that don't know anything about what you're talking about, like customers or, you know, certain managers. Um, they might know a little bit, but they won't know the details, so... Yeah, there's there's lots of things you can do um, sure uh, I'm not sure if this is well I'll just write down the website I think it's catch fire.org I think it's dot org yeah um, that's just one example. There's other websites like that, um, but that was one that I've used in the past. Um, Possible Pilot asks, do you know or study any foreign languages? I know some Spanish, not not enough to, to demonstrate here right now, um, but I did Spanish for a whole year at college and some in high school as well. So I can kind of read some Spanish. Um, I've studied, in the past, I've studied Latin and French. Uh, German very briefly, like hardly worth mentioning briefly. And then I started learning Chinese, but I think I need to re restart over with Chinese because I did not get as far with that as I would have liked. So I think the short answer is yes, I sort of know some Spanish, but I'm not very good at it. I would love to learn French as well, to read French literature. And really, if I could just read a little bit in several languages, that would make me really happy. Um, the speaking part would be cool too, but the reading part is more applicable to my daily life. Um. All right. Well, thanks to everybody who was able to hang out. This was lots of fun went through a lot of great questions and some good books too. So uh, thank you for watching and I will see you soon.